Good morning, grace and peace, friends near and far. Welcome to worship at First Methodist, Maryville, Missouri. We gather this first Sunday after Easter to experience the presence of the risen Christ. And while there may be geographical distance between us, the miraculous thing about the presence of the risen Christ is there is no distance between hearts. Praise God for that. So grab a cup of coffee, light a candle, come on in and prepare to receive. Good morning, friends, and welcome to worship. Just a few announcements. I, I want to keep you encouraged uh, throughout our time. And so I want to share with you some praise reports of what your church staff and volunteers continue to do as we are in this time of social distancing. You might have seen it in our newsletter, but the church is still being the church because that is who we are. 556 cards of encouragement have been written and sent to Maryville, Bedford, and Savannah Mosaic staff. Treat baskets were sent to Maryville Mosaic Hospital break rooms for the staff to keep them encouraged as we pray for those that are on the front line of this health crisis. Cards of encouragements and treats were taken to the Nottoway County Ambulance Barn, the Sheriff's Office, Maryville Police Department, and a Campus Security Office. Chow continues to be a vibrant ministry here at Maryville First United Methodist Church with the serving of up to 151 meals. And I do want to keep you encouraged by telling you that meals were also delivered uh, to the ambulance barn and the sheriff's department, the police uh, department, in order to encourage those that are also working on the front line to protect us and to keep us safe. Friends, we are here to worship and celebrate. And so I just want to usher in the announcement that great things are taking place in your church. That is something that we can celebrate together and we celebrate it together in this time of worship. Here we are, friends. Let us worship together. Amen. And now would you join with us in the singing of Easter People, Raise Your Voices, verses 1 and 3, as Julie Robertson and Carol Baird lead us along the way. Easter People, Raise Your Voices. Easter people and we do raise our voices. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Carol. And now will you move with me into a time of prayer? O oh God, our rock and our redeemer, sink us deep into the knowledge that your love for us is unshakable. You create us. You love us. You redeem us. Therein lies our worth. Guard us, O Holy One, from the temptation to believe that our worth is in other things. Our jobs, our finances, our education, even our relationships. We have worth in our identity in you because you sweep all of humanity into a divine hug and say, you belong. Oh God, we lift up a hurting world to you this morning. 
We lift up the unemployed. We are or know someone who is unemployed. Please provide, please reassure, and spur us to great sharing with one another. We lift up those who are sick and battling illness. May your healing touch find them in powerful ways today. We lift up health care providers and essential workers who are on the front lines. Oh God, honor them for the sacrifices they make. Please protect them and their families. We lift those who are grieving across our nation, the loss of a loved one. Bring comfort, bring peace. God, despite all this, we hold fast to the hope that you are faithful. You promise never to leave us. And you always work things out, all things for your good. So we lift our community and our world to you today. In the name of Christ, amen. Good morning. This morning's gospel lesson is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 29. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind the locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing among them there. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you. The Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. One of the twelve disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, We have seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and place my hand into the wound in his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. And look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. Then Jesus told him, You believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Blessed be the word of God. Thank you, Joel, for that word, the word of God for the people of God. The message today that I want to bring to you is this I believe. I believe. I am a believer. No doubt about it, I believe. And I guess that you would be very pleased to know that your pastor can say, I believe. When I say I believe, I begin to think about the creed, whether it's the Nicene Creed or the Apostles' Creed, whether it's that moment of, uh, of offering confession of faith or stepping into the reality of what it is that I believe. As I believe these words, whether it's the Nicene Creed or the Apostles' Creed that says, I believe in God, the Father Almighty. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Friends, I believe. And I, like many of you, I don't know why I have so much deep belief. I just know that it's there. And I don't know why others don't believe. And I know that many doubt. But you know, the truth of the matter is, is that I cannot remember a time in my life when I did not believe that God is real. 
And then I felt the call to ministry, to servanthood, to volunteerism. And I felt the call into pastoral ministry. There was a, a path that was laid out for me. And maybe you feel a pathway. Maybe you feel a pattern of your own faith experience. And you too can say, this I believe. The scriptures overwhelmingly conceive of a saving relationship with God as a matter of being in a covenant with him. And in Jesus, God created a covenant relationship within humanity, within us, for us. By calling the disciples to journey with him, Jesus called them into a covenant relationship so that he could make them fishers of men, women, and children, so that we all might be able to say, this I believe. So when the disciples were locked up in the upper room and Jesus suddenly appears and see, Jesus makes that visit, you just have to know that something special was about to happen. This this I believe. Two parts of our text this morning from John 20 are presented to us and both have the granting of a specific commissioning and a call to believe. First to the disciples who were locked up in the upper room and second to Thomas. So first this morning, let us look at John chapter 20, specifically verses 19 through 23. And there's these phrases that rise up in this text for me that I want to share with you. And it begins later on that day. In some translations, it says that Sunday evening. This tells us that this was the very evening of that very same morning that Mary went to the tomb and the stone was rolled away the very same day. The stone was rolled away and the tomb was empty. And Mary, out of confusion and fear, runs back to the disciples and says, the Lord is gone. And the disciples run to the tomb. We celebrated this last Sunday morning. They run to the tomb and indeed the stone was rolled away. And the setup inside of the tomb with no Jesus there, no body there, but the burial cloths neatly separated, and they believed. And now we find the disciples that very same day behind locked doors because they were afraid. They had just recently watched Jesus die on the cross, and now his body was gone. Accusations would fly, questions would rise. Will we be treated the same as Jesus? Would we be flogged? Would we be beaten? Would we be crucified? And so they were afraid, and we need to feel their emotion. We need to feel their fear. The door of that upper room was locked for their protection. And then suddenly, as the text said, suddenly Jesus was standing there among them. Here we have an, an emotional pivot. From downright fear to awestruck fear and reverence and confusion. Jesus' appearance is the fulcrum that moves the, the disciples into a deeper believing, overwhelming, captivating, mesmerizing fear, transpiring emotions. And the text says, as he spoke, he showed them his hands and his side. First their master, their teacher, the very one they had spent the past three years with, the one they saw hang on the cross, this one spoke to them and they believed as he showed them where he had been pierced by the nails. 
And secondly, they were filled with joy when they saw, when they recognized, when they knew that it was indeed Jesus. Wouldn't you be? And are you today? Are you filled with this overwhelming joy that Jesus has risen from the grave for you? The Gospel of John continues, when he spoke to them, he said, not once, but twice, and so we know this is very significant, peace be with you. Now the first time that he spoke, peace be with you, was most likely to calm their fear and to help them regain control of their emotion to believe and let the overwhelming fear become overwhelming joy. And he said again, peace be with you. And this time he doesn't stop. Jesus, their Lord, continues, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. The presence of their master, their Lord, their Savior, right before them suddenly with this overwhelming peace that brought about overwhelming joy, this Jesus is offering a commission to them. So I am sending you. These disciples, held up in a room with the door bolted, hiding for their very lives, receive peace and a commission from their Lord. And they enter into a deeper believing. Well, how do we know that they believed? Jesus seals this commissioning by blowing the gift of the Holy Spirit upon them. This gift of belief entered in and the commission, the anointing of these ten was sealed and revealed the purpose of their commission in this time to offer forgiveness of sins. Jesus breathed that blessed purpose into them so that they may enter into the dark places where sin and sorrow roam and offer forgiveness through Christ Jesus which would bring renewal. All that is bound up in heaven and on earth is commissioned, passed forward to those Jesus would entrust with the gospel. The message translation of this text in John chapter 20, specifically John 20 verse 23 says, receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. And he said, if you forgive someone's sins, they're gone for good. If you don't forgive sins, what are you going to do with them? This translation offers a question that should cause us to pause. And I don't know about you, but this, for me, brings up the concept of free will. Jesus offers, but not everyone accepts. Jesus offers forgiveness, not everyone desires to repent. Not everyone wants to change. The disciples, and even us today, we are a witness to the gospel. Not everyone will receive and believe, yet we still love. We still offer kindness, the Jesus kind of kindness, and we still show hospitality. Jesus breathed in the Spirit, his very own holiness into their being and gave them anointed commissioning to offer forgiveness, which offers relationship. Isn't that what this life is all about? The goodness of relationship encircled by the glory of God? Now we look at the second section of our reading this morning, John chapter 20, verses 24 through 29, when Jesus appears to Thomas. You know, when the disciples were in the upper room, locked behind the door on that very day, one of the twelve disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, 
We have seen the Lord. Now if we just remember what they just experienced, seeing His hands and seeing His side and being filled with this overwhelming joy, you know that they just didn't go, hey, guess what, Thomas? We saw the Lord. No. They expressed it with such glory. We have seen the Lord. Thomas, you've got to believe us. We have seen the Lord. Now, we don't know where Thomas was or why he was not with the others locked behind the doors of protection. But when Thomas hears this cry of the disciples, we have seen the Lord, he replies, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and place my hand into the wound in his side. And then John 20, verse 26. Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time, this time, Thomas was with them. And perhaps we should slow down in, in the moment, just slow down in the moment and recognize that for eight days, for eight days, Thomas was left to ponder if the disciples were telling the truth. They, they seemed certain, but he couldn't bring himself to believe. Eight days of wonder. Eight days of grief. Eight days of torment and other emotions that Thomas had to deal with while the other ten continued to be filled with joy because Jesus had breathed the Holy Spirit upon them. And we continue to read this text wondering about Thomas, where he was, and why he did not believe. We find that this part of the text has a similar arrival. The text says the doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. And then we have a very similar statement that we've already heard twice in this John 20. Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hand. Put your hand into my wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. And if we were to pause in this for just a moment, we might wonder. Sometimes we need to be shown in order to believe. Jesus is not condemning Thomas for his unbelief. And he's not condemning us. Jesus is not condemning Thomas, he's not condemning us, but he's moving faith forward toward a blessing. He's saying, stop doubting. Hey, Thomas, stop doubting your friends. Stop doubting these disciples. Don't be unbelieving. As if Jesus is saying, suspend your disbelief long enough to allow belief to rise. As the text says this morning, don't be faithless. Have faith in all that Jesus has spoken before he was crucified. Oh, to be the disciples in that very time, walking in the footsteps, following Jesus so closely to see the miracles, to hear the parables, to be present in the healing. And yet to have those moments of confusion where fear and doubt begin to rise up. And now we have Thomas, the crucified Savior, appearing before him, giving him the same opportunity that he gave the disciples eight days earlier. The crucified Savior is alive. And faith did begin to rise up in Thomas. John 20, verse 28. Thomas exclaimed, 
my Lord and my God. Can you feel that joy begin to rise to that same joy that the ten disciples had when Jesus said, here it is, it is I, peace be with you. As Jesus ushers in the peace that is beyond our understanding, the perfect peace that begins to wash away our fear. Then Jesus told Thomas, You believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me again. I don't believe that Jesus is condemning Thomas for his unbelief. Jesus is not condemning Thomas for his doubt. Thomas was absent and now Thomas is present and now Jesus is speaking this belief into him and to everyone who would have the opportunity to be a witness and to receive the witness. John Wesley's study notes help us to wrap our heart and our head around this text that Thomas believes and Thomas confesses, my Lord and my God. Wesley writes, Thomas sees but never actually touches Jesus. But now he knows the crucified Jesus is risen and he makes the bold confession of faith toward which the entire gospel has been moving. Jesus' final words to Thomas are an implicit commission to help others believe. You see, in our reading today, we see commission on both ends. The ten are commissioned to help forgiveness flow. And Thomas is now commissioned to exercise his faith in order to help others to believe without having to see. This is where we might find ourselves today. The witnesses of today. Jesus is believers in the world today because we believe without seeing because we have received the Holy Spirit of God. So how do we step out of our fear and doubt? How do we step out in this time of uncertainty, in this time of fear and worry and concern? To trust in what it is we already believe in. Oh, we believe in the risen Savior, amen? We are resurrection people. We are Easter people. And how do we step out of the fear and the doubt that our human selves tend to lean in toward and to reach out for instead of reaching out to what Jesus offers? How do we step out of the fear and doubt? By trusting in the power that we have received from the holiness of God? By praying and offering our concerns, laying them at the feet of Jesus. But I will also want to tell you that it is by engagement. Engagement in the things that your church is doing right now. Working hard to find those opportunities to engage one another in remembering that we are the church that we are resurrection people. Trust in that, my friends. We are the resurrection of Jesus today. Because Jesus is the one who gave sight to the blind. Jesus is the one who opens the eyes of the blind. Jesus is the one who gives us the spiritual sight to be his hands and feet in our community today. Jesus is the one who we may ask Jesus, Lord Jesus, my Lord and my God, as the risen Savior, will you, Lord, help my unbelief? Will you believe today? Will you believe that the risen Savior wants to take hold of your emotions for you? and help you to engage and participate 
in this eternal glory as Easter people. Hey out there everybody. We don't do a lot of posting. At least I don't do a lot of posting. <laughs> Um, all of our friends have been putting music out there. Our sons have been putting music out there all the time. So this song has been important to us here. We just came across it recently. And uh, maybe with all the chaos out there in the world, this is kind of something to keep in mind for all, all of you believers out there that uh, you know, God's got this. We'll, we'll get through this, this craziness that's out there and this uh, virus that's growing, going around. It's uh, a mess right now. And there's a lot of people fighting a lot of big fights out there. But we know that we will get through all of this.
stay safe out there, everybody. God bless. As we close today, friends, I'd like to offer a prayer that comes in the form of a song that is written by Sally DeFord, and it is called A Believer's Prayer. I ask that you bow your hearts, and as you hear these lyrics, trust that God has done something spectacular for each and every one of us, and that he is working Holy Spirit miracles for us today. Let us pray. Father in heaven, teach me, I pray, to walk as thy witness on earth. Strengthen my spirit and grant me the faith to serve as the Savior would serve. Let me be light to the wanderer by night, compass and guide to the seeker. Let thy love shine in me, teach me to be an example of the believers. Where there is sorrow, let me impart the hope and the comfort of truth. Where there is suffering, open my heart to do as the Savior would do. Where there is hunger, guide thou my hands to give as the Savior would give. Where there is fear, give me courage to stand and live as the Savior would live. Lord, hear us as our spirits mingle with your spirit and ask to receive from you your everlasting love, your everlasting peace, your everlasting mercy and forgiveness. All that you give to us, let us freely and gladly receive as we step up away from the fear and anxiety and engage in the body of believers that are known now as Easter people. Help us to raise our voices in the name of Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. As we close today, we close with verse number two of Easter people, raise your voices.